electrochemistry. It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> Galvanic cells. We can actually separate two half reactions and force electrons to travel between the two half reactions. And voila, we have electricity. <laughs> Our Gibbs free energy becomes electrical energy in the case of a battery, or we can force reactions to go backwards from what they would like to do by applying electricity to them. <laughs> Here's how we set this up. We would take all the ingredients for one half reaction and put them in one beaker. Here I've got some sort of solution containing zinc 2 plus ions and a chunk of metal zinc. And over here I've got some sort of solution containing iron 3 plus ions and I've got a chunk of iron stuck in it. I can connect them together with a wire so that electrons can travel between them. Over on this side, zinc is going to be oxidized to zinc 2 plus, and over on this side, iron 3 plus is going to be reduced to iron. You may be asking yourself, Mrs. Keith, how do you know it's going to go this way and not the other way? Well, it turns out that zinc wants to become zinc 2 plus way more than iron wants to become iron 3 plus. We will talk more about this later. So as this reaction proceeds, zinc 2 plus ions are going to be leaving the zinc metal. And they are going to leave some electrons behind these two electrons right here. Those electrons are going to go zooming through this wire here. Come over here. This thing is going to become negative. It's going to attract these iron ions, the positive iron ions, which will react with those electrons and just become iron. The iron usually deposits on the surface of this piece of metal here. Seems simple. There is a problem, though. If you know anything about electricity, this is never going to work. Let's zoom in on one of these electrochemical cells, one of the half cells. As this reaction proceeds and electrons leave here and zinc 2 plus ions come out into solution, well, originally, we got zinc 2 plus ions in here by dissolving zinc chloride. So if I put a mole of zinc chloride in here, I would have gotten one mole of zinc, two moles of Cl minuses, and all my charges would be balanced, nice and neutral. But as this reaction proceeds, I get more and more zinc 2 plus ions here. The whole solution is going to become positive. It's going to become so positive that it, electrons are going to find it nearly impossible to leave the area. They're going to be attracted. Zinc 2 plus ions are going to find it impossible to enter the solution, which is getting more and more positive. Oh, no. What will we do? <laughs> Curses. Oh, man. A classic. Well, what we do is we just put a little connector in between, besides the wire where the electrons are going, so that negative ions can flow into this left-hand cell as needed to neutralize the Zn2+. Over on the other cell, we're going to run into the opposite problem. As this reaction proceeds, I'm going to lose positive ions, and they can be replaced from this same chunk of ions in here. This is called a salt bridge. It's usually a little plastic tube filled with a gel that contains something like sodium chloride. The salt bridge has to be full of something that is pretty innocuous. You don't want your salt to be corrosive or an acid or a base or toxic or reactive. NaCl would work pretty well. This is going to keep the charges balanced in our two half cells and that'll allow the electrons to continue to flow. If you're more familiar with electricity, what we're doing here is completing the circuit. The salt bridge can take a lot of different forms. I am always gonna draw it like this, even though it may not physically resemble that. I'll draw it like this. But in real life, a lot of times we just have one big beaker 
and we have a wall between or right down the middle of the beaker that is made out of clay which is a little bit porous and it allows some negative ions to flow through it in our class we've got clay cups they look like this and we will actually have one half cell inside the clay cup and the other solution will be outside the clay cup like this and we'll have one metal electrode here in this clear cup and one stuck into the solution in the clay cup it's really nasty to diagram them this way though even though we're going to do labs using this setup i would still diagram them as if they were in two separate beakers it's way easier for people to follow your diagram there's some vocabulary you need to know that goes with it on the side where oxidation is going on we call this half cell this half reaction cell the anode and over on this side where the reduction is going on, we call this half cell the cathode. More specifically, this chunk of metal is called the cathode, and this chunk of metal is called the anode. The easy way to remember this is to say this 10 times. Anode oxidation. Anode oxidation. Anode oxidation. Someone has also pointed out to me that these are alphabetical. Anode, cathode, alphabetical. A through Z, and then oxidation, reduction, also alphabetical. The terms anode and cathode, you may have seen them on your car battery, come from these words. An anion, that's a negative ion, and the cation, that's the positive ion. The cathode attracts cations. As these electrons come down here, this thing is going to become negatively charged and it's going to attract these positive ions, cations. So let's go back to this question of how do you know this one is going to oxidize while this one is going to get reduced? We've got tables full of what are called reduction potentials. The reduction potential is measured and it basically tells us how much does this reaction want to go forward. The more positive the reduction potential, the more the reaction wants to go forward. These are called standard reduction potentials with a little circle there, which means it's at 25 degrees C and everything has a concentration of one molar. Another name for these potentials is the EMF or electromotive force. It's the force pushing the reaction forward and it's measured in volts 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 are joules per coulomb so it's kind of a potential energy per unit charge coulomb is a kind of charge it's a certain number of electrons and like i said we can just measure this we hook up our electrochemical cells together we measure the voltage and then we can figure out everybody's um, emf for each half reaction by assigning one of them zero Usually it's the hydrogen one. The EMF tells how much a reaction wants to happen. So the more positive the EMF is, the more the thing wants to go forward. So basically, it's saying exactly the same thing as delta G and K. So for reactions that are going to go forward, what is true about delta G, K, and E? Think about it for a second. If the reaction is going to go forward, delta G is less than zero, K is greater than one, and the EMF is greater than zero. So negative delta G, positive EMF, and K is bigger than one. For our two half reactions, neither of these really want to go forward. But uh, this guy is fairly neutral about it. You know, this is almost zero. Zinc, on the other hand, really does not want to do this. So that's okay, because one of them has to get oxidized while the other one gets reduced. They can't both get reduced. So what we're going to do is flip this equation around backwards. And once we flip it around backwards and we change it to oxidation, we change the sign on the EMF. So since it really didn't want to get reduced, it really does want to get oxidized. Kind of makes sense. If 
so I wanted to get the overall reaction for these two half reactions. I would flip around the one, and then I'm going to have to balance my electrons. So I'm going to multiply this one by three to get six electrons there. I'm going to multiply this one by two to get six electrons there. And then I add them up. My electrons cancel. Notice that uh, all my elements are balanced down here and my charges are balanced. Now you might be thinking, EMF, it's kind of like delta H. When I flip this around, I change sign on it. And now when I'm multiplying it by three, maybe I should be multiplying it by three. And you'd be wrong. <laughs> yeah, you don't. Be careful. Don't do it. Don't multiply it by three. The EMF is the potential per electron or per unit charge. So it doesn't really matter how many electrons we have here, since this is telling us the potential energy per electron or per coulomb, actually, but per unit charge, it doesn't really matter how many electrons we've got there. We shouldn't be changing this value. It's the value per electron. A little weird. You'll get used to it. And like I said, EMF, it's measuring the same thing as delta G. So we can switch back and forth between them pretty easily. It's almost just a matter of factor label. We're going to have to take our EMF, and it was in joules per coulomb. We're going to have to switch it to joules per electron. And then we just multiply by the number of electrons. And then we change the sign to make it negative, because delta G and E have opposite signs. So this is the equation. It's on your crib sheet. N is the number of electrons transferred. So that six in your previous equations is going to be important eventually when you go to calculate delta G. The EMF is just, you know, the thing we calculated a second ago. And then Faraday's constant is just to switch our coulombs to moles of electrons. Coulombs, we use them in physics, but not too much in chemistry. So how about if you try some problems? Uh, try drawing a diagram for a lithium copper battery. First, just draw the two half cells, and uh, the copper here is going to be copper 2 plus ion. Pause here. So here are our two half cells, and I went ahead and put the salt bridge in. We don't know yet which way the electrons are going to flow, because we don't really know which of these two things wants to be reduced for. So given the following two EMFs, or electromotive forces, or reduction potentials, determine the overall reaction equation and the overall EMF. You're going to have to decide which one of these to flip around. Pause here and give it a try. So I flip the lithium one around, and I add up my voltages, and then I multiply this top one by two to get my charges balanced, and there's my final equation. Once you've got this voltage, you can find delta G. Darn handy, because we don't have any delta G meters, really, but we have voltmeters. So give that a try. Pause here. There it is. Faraday's constant here, by the way, is on your curve sheet, in case you were worried about memorizing that. Oh, wow. Big negative number for delta G. K must be ginormous. Probably too big to fit on our calculators. Okay, now label your diagram. Show the two half reactions. Show which way the electrons are going to flow. Label the anode and cathode and show the movement of the negative ions in the salt bridge. Pause here for a long time while you do that. There you are. Voila! Huh. Yeah, that's definitely enough for today.